in environmental controls, so ventilation, um, UV, um, et cetera. So I'll hand it over to you, Paul. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to make one correction to what uh, Carrie said, is I'm going to run through this because, because of the lack of time. So again, we're mainly going to discuss environmental controls now during the practical exercise with uh, uh, Vivara, Richard, and myself. We'll do some hands-on type stuff. And we have to remember that uh, you know, it's not just TB infection prevention control, it's, it's airborne and you know, you've seen this picture probably in a zillion different uh, presentations. What you see are not droplet nuclei that can get deep in the lungs. What you see are relatively large droplets that will fall, fall to the ground. So we're trying to protect people from what you can't see in the, uh, in the air. There are a lot of guidelines here. I'm not going to discuss them all other than uh, Matsi talked about the operational handbook. There's also a, a summary of guidelines for infection prevention and control. And from the standpoint of environmental controls in the operational handbook, uh, just one, one disclaimer, the ventilation part was not written by an engineer. So, so we're in the process of uh, reviewing that. A lot of the guidelines for infection prevention and control do not include TB or other airborne organisms, but with SARS around, you know, things are changing a little bit, but not, not enough. There are uh, different country guidelines. If you hit the QR code on the uh, wall, you'll, it'll link you to the ETTI website, and you'll be able to see some different documents, uh, different languages, uh, fit testing, respiratory protection. There are a couple documents on uh, ultraviolet germicidal or radiation or germicidal UV. So you may have seen this quote before as well, is that it may seem a strange principle to enunciate as the very first requirement of a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. So, you know, when we're talking about healthcare facilities, we want to make sure not just with uh, ventilation or just with UV, and again, I'm only talking about environmental controls, that, that, you know, that's not necessarily the answer. It's going to be a package of interventions. So how do we reduce risk? Well, we need to understand risk, and there's just a, a, a quickie uh, video here. Here's some guys jumping out of an airplane, which I've never done and I never planned to do. But the first guy's pretty excited, jumps out. The second guy's not so sure about it. So the, the head uh, parachute guy throws out a, a bottle of, or a case of uh, beer. And, and who just ran out? Okay, now it's not over yet. Now, so the risk changed a few different times, right? And that's what, when we go and look at a facility, it's the same thing. The risk isn't going to be the same today as tomorrow. It's not going to be the same in this section versus that section. So when we're talking about risk, we have to individualize and, and say, okay, you know, what is the risk? What can we do to, to mitigate it? So again, I'm going to talk about environmental controls, which is reducing the concentration and preventing the spread of airborne organisms. And a lot of this is common sense. I was in uh, Peru not too long ago, and, and the top is the ocean, right? And here's a sign, tsunami evacuation route. Now, would you run to the ocean if the tsunami was coming, or would you run away? Well, that's the way a lot of the airborne infection prevention control uh, uh, interventions are. It's, it's a lot of common sense. Now, it's, it's hard to teach common sense, but we can teach basic uh, principles. And the first principle is that we need our administrative controls in place first. And then second to that, when we implement airborne infection prevention uh, controls, what do we need? We need administrative controls to support that. So maybe supporting the maintenance, maybe supporting some other aspect of it to ensure sustainability. Uh, we're going to briefly talk about uh, ventilation, natural mechanical, a combination of the two, which is some call hybrid, some call mixed mode. We'll talk a little bit about uh, ultraviolet germicidal radiation and uh, room air cleaners for just a moment. So what is ventilation? Ventilation is the movement of air, usually by pushing and or pulling of air, and hopefully in a controllable way. Now, we, we don't have time for this, but those that have attended some of my other lectures, I often light a candle and I have them blow it out, which is pretty easy. Then light the candle, and next time you're 
kids or grandkids have a, have a birthday, try to, not them, but you try to suck out the flame. <sighs> so how effective is exhaust only? Well, you'll find you have to be really close to that flame to be able to pull anything into that exhaust. So the ideal ventilation system is supplying air on one side, pushing those organisms to the other side, and then exhausting them out. But exhaust only is used a lot, but it's not necessarily used very effectively. This is from an old uh, WHO infection prevention control document, but it shows a large uh, ward, open windows on both sides, and air moving with the arrows to the right. That's not going to happen because sometimes it may be moving from right to left. Sometimes it may be just sort of moving back and forth. Other times it may not be moving at all. But, but one thing that's happened in a lot of places is they said, oh, well, we're going to give people semi-private rooms instead of a huge ward. So they build a corridor, and what that corridor does is the air's not going to go all the way to that opposite wall, right? It's just going to basically circulate around the, uh, the, the window itself. So you're not going to get a lot of air exchange deep in, into the room. One of the WHO documents published in 2009 is about natural ventilation. Obviously, I don't have time to go into this too much, uh, but they talk about four different types of natural ventilation. And natural ventilation relies on two things. It could be wind, which is horizontal, or it could be buoyancy or temperature differential, which would be your vertical natural ventilation. And again, you know, I could, I, we could probably spend a week talking about natural ventilation, but we've only been given 15 minutes. So here's a, 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 in this case, it's a TB ward. There's a window on the far side. You can't see, but it's an open corridor, another patient ward on the other side. Is that good or not so good for natural ventilation? Well, the windows are closed, so it's, it's absolutely not good. So when we talk about implementing natural ventilation, we have to think about, okay, is this gonna be sustainable, meaning, you know, are, are, are you going to have somebody that's going to keep running around opening the windows every time a patient closes them? Is there an alternative to just open windows? So there's a lot of uh, thought that needs to go into natural ventilation beyond open windows and open doors. Now here's, here's another uh, uh, example. You know, so it's a naturally ventilated ward, relatively uh, crowded. And what do you have in terms of airflow? You see some open windows on the right-hand side, nothing on the left-hand side. So the air is not really going to be flushing whatever is airborne in that ward out. It's just going to uh, perhaps clean a little bit around this uh, uh, right-hand side of this ward. How about this area? It's naturally ventilated, they say. But wintertime, people are wearing coats. They've got all the windows closed. So in essence, there's zero natural ventilation, and we need to think about uh, alternatives to that. Uh, here's another one where it's an outside covered area. Matsi showed you a picture similar to this, which is ideal. You know, the, the clients or patients are sort of following cough etiquette. Uh, there, there are other ways to, to enhance the natural ventilation. This is called a, a wind turbine or whirly bird. Uh, we, we can go into that a little bit more. Sometimes with natural ventilation, you're going to find, okay, it's not feasible to rely on natural ventilation 24-7, 365 days. So you might need to implement some version or some variant of mechanical ventilation. And that's, again, what we call hybrid or mixed mode. So you, you've probably seen this curve a lot. So when we're talking about dilution ventilation, which could be mechanical or natural. What happens once the patient leaves the room or once the aerosol producing procedure is finished? Well, you get this exponential decay. And if you take a look at the first uh, line or line on top, that's one air change per hour. So you're gonna lose about two thirds of the particles in one hour. If you go to two air changes per hour, you're gonna, you know, essentially evacuate or remove, you know, more. Once you get beyond, uh, say, four to six air changes per hour, there's a very tiny 
incremental increase in benefit. So if you hear somebody say, oh, well, we ventilated 24 air changes per hour. Well, that's just marginally better than 12. Or you hear somebody talk about UV light and say, oh, well, we get the equivalent of 100 air changes per hour. Well, that's not much different than 12 when you take a look at the big, at the big picture. So what we want to do is we just want to try to get a lot, not a little, but a lot of air exchange. And, and I don't uh, qualify that other than saying, you know, 12 is probably a lot. So anything beyond that is, is just a benefit, but it's a, it's a tiny, tiny benefit. This table is from the CDC guidelines. It's really just a clearance rate. So if you're in a, let's say, a, a room with a sputum booth, and that sputum booth is ventilated for the equivalent of 12 air changes per hour, that means you'll get a, roughly a 99% reduction in 35 minutes. So it's not immediate, uh, and, and it will take time. Just like a patient room, if you have an infectious patient, whether it's COVID or TB or something else, you know, it's still going to take time to, uh, to reduce whatever might be in the room. If you have patients in the room, you don't have that exponential decay. You reach some you know, coughing and aerosolizing, coughing and aerosolizing, you reach some kind of equilibrium concentration. And depending on the amount of UV and or ventilation, you can increase or decrease the concentration of the organisms in the room. So when we're talking about mechanical ventilation, there are really two, two kinds. There's single pass, which means you have one air supply system, and then you have one exhaust system. And then there's some that are recirculating, and uh, there are all kinds of issues with, with that. And here's an exhaust-only fan. And what happens? They're exhausting from the room and sending it right back into the room. So how effective is that? You know, it's, it's good for the electric company, right? I'm jumping now to a, a set of guidelines from India. I'm not going to go through the, the whole thing, but it's, it's nice to evaluate or, or help you think about what are the advantages of mechanical ventilation, what are the advantages of natural ventilation, you know, when might you need a, a hybrid. So I'm not going to read through this, but it's just to let you know that you know, natural ventilation isn't the only solution. Ventilation is not the only solution. Uh, and when we do the ventilation exercise, Vivara is going to uh, take you through exercises of uh, uh, airflow rate, air exchange rate, or air changes per hour, pressure differential, and air distribution or air airflow patterns in a room. She's going to show you how to use a vanimeter. You can make one yourself, and when you download this presentation, this is in there. Uh, you can use something simple. This is just a mosquito coil. So it makes a little bit of smoke. It's pretty, pretty easy to use, probably relatively uh, easy to get. Let's talk about ultraviolet light technology. There are different terms that are used. You'll hear GUV or germicidal ultraviolet. You'll hear UVC, which is sort of the technical term for a, ba a band of UV. You'll hear the term germicidal light. The classic uh, scientific term would be ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. So you'll see any of those terms and they generally mean the same thing. But we really need to understand what wavelength are we talking about. Richard's gonna show you a 222 unit and a, well actually two, two 222 nanometer units and two 254 nanometer uh, units. We don't have any LED systems here. Uh, but again, if you're gonna install it, we need to understand the wavelength, how to measure it, and how effective that wavelength is against whatever organism of interest you, you might have. So we want to make sure with the upper room UV uh, systems that we have a lot of UV in the upper part of the room, safe levels in the, uh, in the lower part of the room. And again, Richard's going to talk about that uh, a little bit. We've got uh, two louvered fixtures, and louver just keeps the uh, UV from going every direction. So it lowers the exposure of the people in the lower part of the room. So again, I'm just showing you uh, this particular picture because this is a very well-designed building for natural ventilation. It's a single corridor. On the left are all windows. On the right are patient rooms. So air can flow into the patient rooms through their uh, openings to the veranda. And then if the wind's blowing the other direction, it can go this way. 
Well, they realize wintertime, they're not gonna have the windows open. So they supplement the natural ventilation with UV as opposed to trying to figure out some kind of a, a ventilation system to supplement it. So here, here's a UV fixture. What's important about anything, whether it be ventilation or uh, some, some type of a biosafety cabinet or UV? It's maintenance. So we're testing in this uh, uh, TB ward and there wasn't very much UV measured. And why? Okay, well it probably hadn't been maintained in a while. Because you can see, you know, the lamp is, is fully loaded, the, uh, you know, it, it collected a bunch of bugs. So, so when we're talking about anything, and again, that picture is just UV because it's one of my favorite ones, but we want to make sure that we have maintenance. Here's Grigori taking some UV measurements. Here's some more uh, UV measurements because we want to, again, we want to make sure it's, it's safe for the occupant because it doesn't matter if it's 222, 254, or an LED. We want to make sure that we aren't overexposing people in the occupied space. Uh, what I showed you before were mainly 254 units. Here are a couple of 222 units. And really briefly, let's talk about room air cleaners. What are room air cleaners? How would you define room air cleaner? How about boat anchor? Okay. And the reason I'm saying that is very few, they come in different shapes. Some have filters, some have other things. Uh, the, you can see this one, there's no air actually going into that air cleaner. It just, it's, it's waffling towards the guy on the right hand side. Uh, here's another air cleaner. How much UV will go through that plastic shield? Zero. And, and you'll, you'll see that later. And here, this is from a uh, uh, Eastern European uh, manufacturer of room air cleaner. And the blue line is a decay. So you think, okay, that's great. Well, if you actually take a look at the data, that air cleaner provide about a quarter of an air change per hour. So if you want six air changes per hour, you need 24 of those units. And if you want 12 air changes per hour, you need 48 room air cleaners. So is it really feasible? The, the answer is there are a few good air cleaners, but not, not very many. So to just summarize here is the hierarchy you know, must be implemented. So we really have to do the administrative controls first. And it's, there's not a specific list of must do interventions. It's gonna be a package. It may be a package of X for one group. It may be a package of Y for another group. But the whole idea is we implement many, many different things in hopes of reducing infection. So on that, I thank you.